I was at Agenda 2000, and uh, one of the people who was there was Craig Mundy, who is some kind of high mucky muck at Microsoft. I think uh, Vice President of Consumer Products or something like that. And uh, I hadn't actually met him. I, I, I uh, bumped into him in an, at an elevator, in an elevator. And uh, I looked at his badge and said, ah, I see you work for Microsoft. And he looked back at me and said, oh, yeah, and what do you do? And I thought he seemed just a, a, sort of a tad dismissive. I mean, here's the archetypal you know, guy in a suit looking at a scruffy hacker. And so I gave him the thousand yard stare and said, I'm your worst nightmare. For most of its short but colorful history, the computer industry has been dominated by the Windows operating system. But that could soon change, as Windows faces a strong challenge from Linux. Silicon Valley has long been the place to develop... technology to achieve its goals, this revolution began in the 1980s with the free software movement and the GNU project, and now is most commonly associated with Linux and the open source movement. We do have one sector that is taking off today, it is the Linux sector. And I thought this might be a good opportunity to say, what is Linux? And I'll uh, answer this question for you. Many of you probably already know, but there are 12 million users out there. A computer operating system developed by hundreds of programmers collaborating on the Internet. A challenge to Microsoft Windows NT. Very popular for its speed. And so this is what the craze is about. To kind of explain what Linux is, you have to explain what an operating system is. And the thing about an operating system is that you, I mean, you're not, never ever supposed to see it. Because... Nobody really uses an operating system. People use programs uh -huh. on their computer. And the only mission in life of an operating system is to help those programs run. So an operating system never does anything on its own. It's only waiting for the programs to ask for certain resources or, or ask for a certain file on the, on the disk or ask for the programs to connect them to the outside world. And then the operating system comes, steps in and, and tries to make it easy for people to write programs. Open source is a way for people to collaborate on software without being encumbered by all of the problems of intellectual property, having to negotiate contracts every time you buy a piece of software, have a lot of lawyers involved. In general, we just want to get the software to work and we want to be able to have people contribute fixes to that, etc. So we sort of sacrifice some of the intellectual property rights and just let the whole world use the software. Before there could be Linux, there was Richard Stallman and the free software movement. I mean, think of Richard Stallman as the great philosopher, right? And think of me as the engineer. Richard Stallman is the founding father of the free software movement. Through his efforts to build the GNU operating system, he created the legal, philosophical, and technological foundation for the free software movement. Without these contributions, it's unlikely that Linux and open source would have evolved into their current forms today. I joined the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab in 1971. I joined a thriving community of hackers people who loved programming, loved exploring what they could do with computers, and they had developed a complete operating system, entirely written there, and I became one of the team that continued to improve the operating system, adding new capabilities. That was my job, and I loved it. We all loved it, that's why we were doing it. And <clears throat> we called our system the incompatible time-sharing system, which is an example of the playful spirit which defines a hacker. Hackers are people who enjoy playful cleverness. 
Well, it first started going wrong as the outside world started pressuring us to have passwords. We didn't have any passwords on our computer. And the reason was that the hackers who'd originally designed the system realized that passwords were a way that the administrators could control all the users. And they didn't want to build tools, you know, locks and keys for the administrators to control them. So they just didn't do it. They left that out. And we had the philosophy that whoever is sitting at the computer should be able to do whatever he wants, and somebody else who was there yesterday shouldn't be controlling what you do today. When they put passwords onto one of the machines at MIT, I and a bunch of other hackers didn't like it. I decided to try a subversive sort of hack. <clears throat> I figured out how to decode the passwords. So by looking at the database of encoded passwords, I could figure out what each person would actually type to log in. And so I sent messages to people saying, hello, I see that you've chosen the password mumble, or whatever it was. How about if you do as I do, just type enter for your password. It's much shorter, much easier to type. And of course, with this message, I was implicitly telling them that the security was really just a joke anyway. But in addition, I was letting them in on this hack. And eventually, a fifth of all the users on that computer joined me in using just enter as their passwords. Where did the ideas that led to what is now called open source, where, how did that begin? Who, who began that? Well, it actually began with the start of computers because at that time, software was just passed around between people. And I think it was only like in the late 70s, early 80s, that people started really closing up their software and saying, no, you can never get a look at the source code. You can't change this software, even if it's necessary for you to fix it for your own application. And um, you can actually blame some of that on Microsoft. They were one of the real pioneers of the proprietary software model. In the mid-1970s, a group of hackers and computer hobbyists in Silicon Valley formed the Homebrew Computer Club. In the club's January 31st, 1976 newsletter, Bill Gates of the recently formed Microsoft wrote an open letter to the community where he made a point-by-point -point argument for the relatively new concept of proprietary software. Up to that point, the practice of computer users had been to freely pass around software with not much thought given to its ownership. Known as an open letter to hobbyists, Bill Gates writes, to me, the most critical thing in the hobby market right now is the lack of good software courses, books, and software itself. Without good software and an owner who understands programming, a hobby computer is wasted. Will quality software be written for the hobby market? Gates goes on to write, The feedback we have gotten from the hundreds of people who say they are using BASIC has all been positive. Two surprising things are apparent, however. One, most of these users never bought BASIC, and two, the amount of royalties we have received from sales to hobbyists makes the time spent on Altair BASIC worth less than $2 an hour. Why is this? As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Is this fair? One thing you don't do by stealing software is get back at MITS for some problem you may have had. MITS doesn't make money selling software. One thing you do do is prevent good software from being written. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three-man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute it for free? The fact is, no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. What about the guys who resell Altair Basic? Aren't they making money on hobby software? Yes, but those who have been reported to us may lose in the end. They are the ones who give hobbyists a bad name and should be kicked out of any club meeting they show up at. I would appreciate letters from anyone who wants to pay up or has a suggestion or comment. Signed, Bill Gates, General Partner, Microsoft. In the late 70s and early 1980s, Richard Stallman was doing artificial intelligence research and coding at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Richard had a number of negative experiences during that period which soured him on the whole idea of commercial software. Such as? Um, some code that he wanted to work on and wanted to fix was locked up and he couldn't get the company that owned the code to let him fix it even though it would have been to their advantage to do so. And that put me into a moral dilemma, you see, because to get one of the modern computers of the day, which was the early 80s, 
you would have to get a proprietary operating system. The developers of those systems didn't share with other people. Instead, they tried to control the users, dominate the users, restrict them, saying, if to get this system, you have to sign a promise you won't share with anybody else. And to me, that was essentially a promise to be a bad person, to betray the rest of the world, cut myself off from society, from the cooperating community. And I had already experienced what happened when other people did that to us, when they refused to share with us because they had signed these contracts. And it hurt the whole lab, kept us from doing useful things before. So I just wasn't going to do that. I felt this is wrong. I am not going to live this way. And from experiences like this, he developed a profound hostility to the idea of intellectual property and software. He eventually acted this out by founding the Free Software Foundation. So I looked for another alternative, and I realized I was an operating system developer. If I were to develop another operating system, and then as the author, encourage everyone to share it, say, everyone, you can come and get it, use this, form a new community, not only could I give myself a way to keep using computers without betraying other people, but I'd give it to everybody else too. Everybody would have a way out of that moral dilemma. And so I realized this was what I had to do with my life. I actually began the project in January of 1984. That's when I resigned from my job at MIT to start developing the GNU operating system. Now I should explain that the name GNU is a hack because it's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's not Unix. You see, so the G in GNU stands for GNU. And what the name means is, I was developing a system that was like the Unix operating system, but was not the Unix operating system. This was a different system. We would have to write it completely from scratch because Unix was proprietary. We were forbidden to share Unix. We couldn't use Unix. It was useless for a community. So we had to write a replacement for it. Throughout the 1980s, as Richard Stallman was building the GNU project, computer scientists from the University of California at Berkeley were developing their own free operating system. Known as Berkeley Unix, or BSD, it was based upon the Unix kernel which had been licensed from AT&T. However, due to legal problems with AT&T and fragmentation of the source code, hackers and other non-institutional users were slow to adopt it. Well, Unix consisted of a large number of separate programs that communicated with each other. So we just had to replace these programs one by one. So what I started doing was writing a replacement for one program, and then another, and then another, and then people started joining me because I published an announcement inviting other people to join me to help write these programs. And, uh, and by around 1991, we had replaced practically all of them. What were some of the programs that you... Well, we had to... To have a complete system, you need to have a kernel, which is the program that allocates resources to all the other programs. You need a compiler, which translates a program from readable source code that programmers can understand into numbers, mysterious numbers that the computer can actually run. You need other programs that go with the compiler to help do this job. You need a debugger. You need a text editor. You need text formatter. You need mailers. You need lots and lots of things. There are hundreds of programs in a Unix-like operating system. I, I saw Stallman's announcement. Actually, I met him in February of 1987. He came to give a five-day tutorial on Emacs at our company. And during the day, he would explain new ways to think about Emacs and ways to extend and enhance it and to use the Emacs source code uh, for better or worse. But in the evening, he was, he was busily working on this compiler, and he had not yet released it to the public, so he was, uh, he was being a little bit uh, uh, careful about who, who got to see the source code. But I was very eager, and when he first announced it in June, I downloaded it immediately. I, I played with it, I got some, some pointers from him, and when I sent the source code back to him, he was, uh, he was very actually amazed at how quickly uh, I was able to ramp up on his technology. Whenever we worked on something at Stanford or in the university, we would get, mostly at the time, we were working off of machines from digital equipment or Sun, mostly Sun. Whenever we would get a Sun machine, 
the first thing we would do is we would spend literally days downloading GNU free software from the internet, building it and installing it on that Sun machine. The crucial thing about GNU is that it's free software. Now, free software refers not to price, but to freedom. So think of free speech, not free beer. The freedoms that I'm talking about are the freedoms to make changes if you want to, or hire somebody else to make changes for you if you're using the software for your business, to redistribute copies, to share with other people, and to make improvements and publish them so that other people can get the benefit of them too. Now those are the freedoms that distinguish free software from non-free software. These are the freedoms that enable people to form a community. If you don't have all these freedoms, you're being divided and dominated by somebody. My first experience contributing to free software came in late 1989, early 1990. I was working as a graduate student at Stanford University on computer-aided design tools. One of the pieces I needed was a tool called a parser generator. Well, the Free Software Foundation under Richard Stallman had created a great tool called Bison. I needed a tool that worked with C++. Bison worked with C. I modified Bison to create something called Bison++. And it was a tremendous feeling of empowerment to be able to take a piece of software that was available and create what you needed in a very short piece of time by modifying it. I put it back on the internet and I was amazed at the number of people that picked it up and started using it. In fact, I remember going to uh, job interviews. I at various times considered just going out and getting a job and I had gone to a job interview and I was talking with one of the people and I started asking them about what tools they used and they said, gee, we use Bison++. And I said, oh, I'm the author of Bison++. Free software generally does have a copyright, it does have an owner, and it has a license. It is not public domain. If we put the software in the public domain, somebody else would be able to make a little bit of changes and turn that into a proprietary software package, which means that the users would be running our software, but they wouldn't have freedom to cooperate and share. To prevent that, we use a technique called copyleft. The idea of copyleft is that it's copyright flipped over. And what we do is we say, this software is copyrighted, and we, the authors, give you permission to redistribute copies. So we give you permission to change it. We give you permission to add to it. But when you redistribute it, it has to be under these terms, no more and no less. So that whoever gets it from you also gets the freedom to cooperate with other people if he wants to. And then in this way, everywhere the software goes, the freedom goes too. And it becomes an inalienable right to cooperate with other people and form a community. And so what is that, the license, what, what is that going? Well, copyleft being a general idea, in order to use it, you have to have a specific example. And the specific example we use for most GNU software packages is the GNU general public license particular document in legalese which accomplishes this job. A lot of other people use that same license. For example, Linus Torvalds uses that license for Linux as well. Well, the license I use is the GNU general public license. That's the one that Richard Stallman wrote. And I think it's a really astounding contribution. Uh, it's one of the few software licenses that was written from the standpoint of the community rather than from the standpoint of uh, protecting a company or uh, as is the case with the MIT and the BSD license, uh, performing the goals of a government grant program. Uh, and the GPL is really unique in that it's not just a license, it's a whole philosophy that I think motivated the open source definition. I, don't hide that a lot of what I do came from Stallman. A crucial step in the growth of GNU, Linux, and the free software movement was the creation of businesses based upon the software and philosophy. Ground zero for the beginning of the business phase was the Electronics Research Lab at Stanford University. Known as ERL, the lab was the place where the first GNU and Linux businesses found their inspiration. So right here is where ERL was. That would have been the entrance over there next to the uh, Electrical Engineering McCullough Building. As you walk in, you come in, you walk down the hallway down here, 
my office would have been about, about here. And then right across the hall from that was Michael Tiemann's office. Michael Tiemann took uh, and started a company, Cigna Software, where the idea was to sell consulting and services around the GNU free software. And, well, Michael's done very well with Cygnus. Well, uh, I spent a lot of time working out uh, how we were going to make money, and in the original GNU manifesto, which is the last chapter of the GNU Emacs manual, Stallman proposed a number of different possible ways to make money. From the beginning of the free software movement, I've had the idea that there's room in it for business to be done. One of the advantages of free software is that there's a free market for any kind of service or support. So if you are using software in your business and you want good support, you have a choice of people to go to for it. You have a choice of businesses that are in the business of providing you with support. So they're going to have to, in general, give you good support or you'll go to somebody else. With proprietary software, support is a monopoly. There's one company, typically, that has the source code and only they can give you support. So typically, you're at the mercy of a monopoly. That's the case, for example, with Microsoft. So no wonder the support is so bad. The benefits of free software were tremendous, but the cost of supporting it internally uh, made managers very, very nervous. And so the, f the fundamental idea I had was if we could build a model that could deliver two to four times the support and, uh, and, uh, and hand-holding capability that an internal engineer could provide, and we could do it at one half to one quarter of the cost, that would meet the test of whether or not people would actually buy. And by about the fall of that year, we had all of the things worked out about who we needed on the technical team, what the terms of the sale would be, what the key price points were, and we actually received our incorporation in November of 1989. One of the most difficult things in starting our company was actually finding a name for it. I explained this to one of my friends, we were having difficulty, and he returned an email message that basically just had a bunch of words with the name GNU in it. And Cygnus was the one that looked least uh, obnoxious and least obscene. I can say very clearly that Cygnus was the first business that specialized in free software. Cygnus supported free software, filled a very essential niche because we had this great software, you could get it for nothing, but you couldn't get support, and they made their money by charging for support. The GNU project started by building a toolkit of basic development tools such as a C compiler, a debugger, a text editor, and uh, other necessary apparatus. And their intention was eventually to develop a kernel to sit underneath those and be the center of the operating system. By about 1990, they had successfully developed that toolkit, and it was in wide use on a great many variants of, of Unix, but there was still no free kernel. The kernel happened to be one of the last things we started to do, and we had started it not long before. And that's when Linus Torvalds came along. Linus or Linus? What's exactly your preferred pronunciation? Um, when I speak Swedish, it's Linus. When I speak Finnish, it's Linus. When I speak English, it's Linus. And I really don't care how people pronounce my name. But Linux is always Linux. He developed a kernel and got it working faster than we got ours working and got it to work very nicely and solidly. His kernel is called Linux. The initial goal was my very personal goal to be able to run a similar environment on my computer that I had grown used to at, at the university computers. And I could not find anything that suited me for that. Right? So having been doing computers for all my life, basically, at that point I just decided that I'll do my own. Um, most of the inspiration early on came from, from Sun OS, which was what um, I was using at the university at the time. Which university? University of Helsinki in Finland. From 1991 to about 1993 was really, I guess, the infancy period of Linux. That was when it was still only alpha or beta quality. It was relatively unstable. although. Even then, it was a good deal more stable than a lot of what are now called production operating systems. Linus used the traditional tried and true method of writing one program that does the job, and he got it to work quickly, in fact, faster than I would have thought was possible. The 
term for it is monolithic, which means that basically the OS itself is one entity, indivisible. Um, while in a microkernel, uh, the the operating system kernel is actually uh, just a collection of servers that do different things, and then they have a common protocol for doing communication between themselves. So why is it that if if the GNU project had had so much lead time, so to speak, doing this, why was why is it that he was able to kind of come in at the tail end, well, so to speak? Well, we actually started the GNU herd not long before he started Linux. And as it happened, though, we chose a design that's a very advanced design in terms of the power it gives you, but also turns out to be very hard to debug. It, we decided to divide up the kernel, which traditionally had been one program, to divide it up into a lot of smaller programs that would send messages to each other asynchronously to, to communicate. And the problem is that that style of programming has a great deal of potential for bugs, which are often very hard to figure out because they depend on does this, send, does this program send this message before or after this one sends that message? And the result was it took us years to get the thing to work. What is Linux's relationship to the GNU project? Well, there's, there's relationships to, to GNU on kind of multiple levels. One is just the philosophical level of, of thinking that making your source open is a good idea. When Linus developed the kernel, he wasn't doing it for the GNU project. He did it independently. And he released it independently, and we didn't know about it. But some of the people who did know about it decided to look for what else they could find to put together with that kernel to make a whole system. And they looked around, and lo and behold, everything they needed was already available. What good fortune, they thought, but actually there was no chance about it. They had found all the pieces of the GNU system which was missing just the kernel. So when they put all that together, really they were fitting Linux into the gap in the GNU system, but they didn't know that. There's a lot of these programs um, done by the Free Software Foundation and done by other people like Linux, and there's a symbiosis between Linux and the programs so that the programs run on Linux and at the same time and they take advantage of Linux as a platform while Linux takes advantage of the programs by just being able to use them. What, what programs? Um, for the, the main one is actually the GNU C compiler which without a C compiler it would not have been possible to to make Linux or most of, of the open programs available. Uh, Linux uses the GPL and I agree with the kind of philosophy behind the GPL. Uh, that said, the GPL itself is, is not a very pretty document, which is probably just because uh, no lawyeries can ever be very pretty. Well, I'd been playing around with Linux for actually late 92, early 93 for about a year before I decided it was to the point where it actually had everything that I needed to really replace the Sun workstation. And I was looking for a way to have a Unix workstation at home. At the time, we used Sun Spark stations in the office at Stanford. Those machines cost us about $7,000. Now, I desperately wanted a Unix machine at home. There's always this thought you get as a graduate student, gee, if I could work at home, then I would be so much more productive, I would graduate sooner because I would finish my thesis sooner. Well, well is, it, is it true? Well, you can judge, you know. Uh, uh, most people end up spending a lot of their time becoming more productive so that if they ever actually worked on their thesis, they'd finish it in a day. It takes a while sometimes. So I decided I wanted a Unix machine at home. And I went out there and was able to use Linux together with a PC for about $2,000, I put together a system that was one and a half to two times faster than that $7,000 Sun Spark station. That was absolutely amazing. I had one and a half to two times the speed at a third to a fourth the price. Light bulbs went off. I knew there was an opportunity here. This was a chance to, to really do something better than what Sun has done around open source.
and Linux. I called it Linux originally as a working name. And, and that was just because Linus and the X has to be there. It's Unix. I mean, it's, it's like a law. And, and what happened was that I initially thought that I can't call it Linux publicly because it's just too egotistical. And that was before I had a big ego, right? They thought they were taking a whole bunch of components and putting them around Linux. So they ended up calling the whole thing a Linux system. And somehow that term caught on. And the result is there are now 10 million people using this variant of the GNU system, the GNU slash Linux operating system, and most of them don't know it. So, some people advocate that it be described as GNU slash Linux. I mean, what's your thought on that? Is that justified? or? Well, I think it's justified, but it's justified if you actually make a GNU distribution of Linux. The same way that I think that Red Hat Linux is fine, or SUSE Linux, or Debian Linux. Uh, because if you actually make your own distribution of Linux, you get to name the thing. But calling Linux in general GNU Linux, I think, is just ridiculous. I got involved in Fall 93 because I was sent a copy of the first CD-ROM commercial Linux distribution, which was called Yggdrasil. It was produced by Adam Richter. And I got a copy because I had been myself writing free software for a long time, since the early 80s. I was actually one of the early GNU contributors myself. And I was absolutely astonished. I was completely astonished because I'd been a software engineer for nearly 15 years at that point. And according to all the rules I, I knew about controlling complexity, keeping your project group small, having closely managed ob objectives, Linux should have been a disaster, and it wasn't. Instead, it was something wonderful, and I was determined to figure out how they were getting away with that. In order for Linux to grow beyond the world of the computer programmer, it needed a use, an application, that made it a must-have technology. That threshold was crossed with the development of a program that made complex websites possible. That program is the Apache Web Server. The killer app of Linux was undoubtedly the Apache Web Server. If you look at the history of Linux, the adoption curve of Linux and the adoption curve of the Internet exactly track each other. 1993, which was when the Apache Web Server project really got started, was also the beginnings of the popular ISP explosion, when the Internet first became a mass market commodity, and the idea of web-based electronic commerce and, and mass communication became real. I think it was one of the first applications that caused people to go, well, if, if I install Linux, I get some tangible benefit from doing so, right? I mean, clearly there were a lot of interesting applications on Linux at, at, at the time, this being maybe two or three years ago when this thing really started to take off. But there wasn't a, comp a driving, you know, you could almost say business case for someone to use Linux versus using NT until, I think, Apache. And, and a lot of the things that plugged into Apache and, and, and enhanced Apache. I mean, when you went to go out, build, uh, go out and build a server farm, it was much more cost effective, cost effective, real dollar terms, to build it on Linux and Apache than it was to build it on IAS and NT. Even if it meant that you had to spend a little bit of money to train your staff to learn how to use that or to find people who were knowledgeable. But the good news was that that knowledge wasn't very expensive because there were all these college students out there who had been using Linux for a long time and, and were very familiar with it. If you look at the trend curves in web servers, Apache has steadily been gaining in market share ever since. It's up to something like 66% now. It's steadily clobbered all of the closed source competition. And that's because it's more reliable, it's more flexible, it's more extensible. It does what webmasters actually need. And the combination of Apache and Linux found its way into a great many commercial shops. Essentially, Apache became the application that motivated internet service providers and e-commerce companies to choose Linux over Microsoft's Windows. It would probably run best on Linux and on FreeBSD. And the reason is the communities around those operating systems are also the communities that contribute the most back to Apache, right? Uh, and they were also the operating systems that internet service providers started using very heavily as well. Um, and internet service providers really liked Apache because it allowed them to do a lot of different things that some of the commercial web servers didn't, such as the ability to host more than one website on a single box, which clearly if you're an ISP and you have 40,000 users and they all want their own website, is going to be pretty important to you. 
One of the key factors in the growth of Linux was the creation of companies that specialized in the distribution and support of the operating system itself. Among these companies, Red Hat Software is the best known. Red Hat started as the product of uh, Mark Ewing. While he was working at IBM, he wanted a, a little better Linux distribution. He started playing around. Found out he, uh, he he spent more time maintaining his Linux distribution than he did uh, than he did working on his new project. So he, uh, he he sort of started the distribution itself. He met up with Bob Young, who at the time was running a company called ACC Bookstore, which was a mail order PC Unix uh, catalog. And Bob kind of knew he wanted something you know more his own to market rather than reselling other people's products. And, and he was fairly good at marketing. And, and Mark, uh, Mark knew he needed some marketing help because he was fairly good at the technical part. So they kind of got together. I started working with Red Hat in May of 1995, basically right out of NC State, along with uh, Eric Troen, who me and him combined make up employees number four and five. Um, and we actually reported to work at an apartment that uh, Mark Ewing used to live in. Um, we took it over as kind of the development part of Red Hat software. Uh, and stayed that way till about November of 1995 when, uh, when a toilet we had in the apartment kind of exploded, flooded our downstairs neighbor, and she got a little upset. And, uh, and, and the apartment folks found out we were running a business there instead of actually living there at the same time. So they decided to throw us out. So at that point, we had about a week to go find uh, our first office, which we did, and get ourselves moved uh, in a hurry. So. We started going in, again, 95 or so to the venture capital firms, asking, saying, there's something happening here. There's a great business opportunity to build the next sun for open source. Well, the venture capitalists looked at this and said, gee, it's, you're selling systems, uh, the software's free, this is kind of scary. We're not sure that we want to want to put money in. And by the way, we we funded other systems companies, and and it hasn't really hasn't really panned out. We're scared. I came to the U.S. about three years ago, and the reason really was that I'd been spending like six or seven years at Helsinki University, and decided that it was time to see the real world and not just university life. Especially this area had a lot of the most interesting work being done. So I just decided that let's try to move halfway across the, the world and, and give this a try. And it's turned out pretty well. Uh, do you see this as temporary or long term? Well, we saw it as temporary at first, and I think it's certainly looking like it's turning long term. Our youngest daughter is both a US and a Finnish citizen because she was born here. and. and the older one is speaking both Swedish and English, so. major event was one that I had a direct hand in. I wrote a paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which was my observations, my anthropological analysis of what it was that made the open source world work. We didn't call it that then. We were still using the term free software primarily. So it was my observation of what made the free software world work and why we were able to produce extremely high quality software in spite of constantly violating all of the standard rules of software engineering. In that paper, I was setting up a contrast between two different styles of development, two opposed styles of development. One, which is the conventional closed development style, which I, I called the cathedral style. In that one, you have tight specification of objectives, um, small project groups which are run in a fairly hierarchical, authoritarian manner, uh, and you have long release intervals. On the other hand, what I identified as happening in the Linux world was a much more peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized market or bazaar-like style in which you have very short release intervals and constant solicitation of feedback from people who are formally outside the project, a very intense, intense peer review process. 
And the startling thing was that the more I looked at this, the more it seemed that trading away all the supposed advantages of conventional closed development for that one single advantage of massive independent peer review actually seemed to win, actually seemed to get you good results. The reason Netscape is important is that they were the first large company to participate in open source. We had Cygnus providing support, but we didn't really have much business. And Netscape went to open source essentially as a way to fight Microsoft, which was giving away Internet Explorer, but not letting anyone else have the source code, not letting companies collaborate. Working as part of the Salesforce, I got a good, I got a good idea of why people bought our software and what it took to make our software successful in the marketplace against competitive products. However, the problem was, we were seeing is that, is that as time went on, our software was uh, being competed against by other people's software, particularly Microsoft's. And as time went on, the price of our software had to drop because other people were giving their software away at, at no charge or at, or at little charge. Now, the real problem was that they feared that Microsoft would achieve a monopoly lock on the browser market, and they would then use that monopoly lock to uh, pervert, actually, the HTTP and HTML standards that the web depends on. And once they had uh, turned those standards into lock-in devices, they could then use that control to drive Netscape out of the server market, which is where it was making its real money. My concern was that as time went on, Netscape's business would be threatened by the fact that we didn't have enough people to do all the things we needed to do as a company in order to keep our software viable in the marketplace. The Netscape release happened in early 1998. And uh, I was told later, I had no idea at the time, that it came about as a direct result of the right people having read The Cathedral and the Bazaar. The Cathedral and the Bazaar, the paper by Eric Raymond, was in a significant influence on Netscape's decision to release source code. Came as a complete shock to me. I wasn't really ready for the thought that I was changing the world, even by accident. However, it was not by any means the only influence on that decision, uh, and not necessarily the most important one when, when all is said and done. Uh, as I said, Netscape, Netscape had already been talking about releasing source code for quite some time before anybody had ever heard of Eric's paper. Linux Congress in early 1997, which was the first place that I gave that paper, and one of the people who heard it was Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Associates. And uh, he thought it was pretty intriguing. And he asked me to give it at his first Pearl conference, which was uh, later that year, in fall of 97. And apparently what happened, I was told later, although I had no idea this was happening at the time, uh, is that some people from Netscape actually heard the, the, the paper at the Pearl conference and took those ideas back to Netscape and they kind of lit a fire there. The role of my paper was essentially to make the internal case at Netscape, uh, to make the business case for why Netscape should release its source code. The paper was called Netscape Source Code as Netscape Product. Um, a strange title, essentially the, the, what the title meant was that, in my opinion, we, we needed to, to think of source code not just as something that was used in creating our products, but as something that was a product in its own right, something that customers might use, other people might use. I then looked at what the business models might be if we release source code for our products. How would we license them? How do we, how do we uh, sell products in this environment? Um, then I looked at the competition, uh, particularly Microsoft. Uh, what would they be likely to do if we release source code? Was there some way they could use our source code against us? I used Eric's paper as an example of how distributed development could work, uh, how a company could develop software not just using their own people, but also working with people on the internet. Uh, and I, that's why I included a reference to Eric's paper in, in my paper. Once my paper was circulated, the people who read my paper would naturally enough find a reference to Eric's paper and, and read that as well. And who was involved in making that happen at Netscape? Primarily, the person who made the actual decision was Jim Barksdale. Uh, and this turned out to be important later, that our big win the big score that gave us mainstream visibility and credibility with investors 
came not because of bottom-up evangelism from a bunch of engineers, but because one strategist at the top saw the potential power of this method and then essentially imposed that vision on everyone underneath him. When I completed the paper, I first gave a copy to Mark Andreessen, who was co-founder of Netscape and was, was at the time one of, in the senior management team at Netscape. Mark then gave a copy of the paper to several other people within Netscape management, uh, including Jim Barksdale. I'm not sure exactly when Jim and the other senior managers uh, made the actual decision. Uh, it, I believe it was in early January sometime. Uh, Netscape actually announced uh, that it was going to release the source code on January 22nd, at the same time that they released that they were going to give Communicator away for free. When Netscape decided to release the source code, uh, people sort of got a wake-up notice that said, you know, hey, maybe there is something to this idea of releasing source code and doing development with people outside your company. Um, so Netscape's decision brought a lot of public attention to the idea of free software, what, you, what became known as open source, and brought a lot of attention to the Linux operating system, which was one of the most prominent examples of open source software at that time. This is our first office, Mountain View, California. We moved here in early 1995. This is 4,000 square feet. It was an incredible leap of faith for us to move out and take the company to our own office. Now what's really important about this place is that this is the office where the term open source was invented. If you walk into an executive's office and you say, free software, okay, if you're lucky, the response you'll get is something like, hmm, Hmm. Uh, free software must be cheap, shoddy, worthless. Uh, and if you're not lucky, it has uh, associations with, uh, with the Free Software Foundation's wholesale attack on intellectual property rights, which regardless of what you think about the ethics of that, it's lousy marketing. It's not something that, that uh, businesses want to hear. So Eric Raymond knew that there was a problem. We'd been calling this free software, but People took the term free and associated with free of charge. They thought that you couldn't make money or you couldn't sell, which is exactly the wrong concept. We wanted to get across the idea that the software was open and that the source code was available. Very important pieces. We had this meeting at the VA offices in Mountain View where Eric, myself, uh, and Christine Peterson from the Forsyth Institute joined us as well as several other people. Christine Peterson was there by phone. Um... Uh, John Mad Dog Hall was also there by phone. Um, a guy named Todd Anderson, who later worked for SUSE for a while, was there. Sam Ackman, who now runs Penguin Computing, was there. He was, uh, he was an employee of, of a VA at the time. Well, we came up with the concept of open source. We called Linus, in fact, and asked Linus if he liked it. He was interested. He liked it. Eventually, we came up with something that replaced free software. So that was the beginning choose, of open source. How did you choose the words open source? Do you remember? You know, I think Christine Peterson was the person who really came up with the idea. Uh, we wanted, again, the idea that the source code was out there and uh, it was open. There weren't many choices. <clears throat> well, since the first three recipients have spoken for the open source movement, I think I should speak about the free software movement. The open source movement focuses on practical advantages that you can get by having a community of users who can cooperate on interchanging and improving software. I agree completely with the points they make about that. The reason why my views are different, why I am in the free software movement rather than the open source movement, is that I believe there's something more important at stake, that freedom to cooperate with other people, freedom to have a community is important for our quality of life. It's important for having a good society that we can live in. And that that is, in my view, even more important than having powerful and reliable software. But I think some of the people in the free software camp are a little scared by the commercialization. Um, and, you know, of course, a rebel is put off by success. Uh, I think that commercialization is very important. We want to mainstream this software. And I work with Richard Stallman, who's the gray-haired man of free software, uh, on a regular basis. And I don't feel I have any philosophical differences 
um, me as author of the open source definition, and he is originator of free software uh, as an organized thing, uh, except for one thing, Richard wants all software to be free, and I think that free software and non-free software should coexist. That's the only difference we have. Uh, we decided early on that what we needed a, a, a definition. We needed a kind of meta license to define the to term open source. And what we came up with is a document called the Open Source Definition. It's derived from the Debian Free Software Guidelines that were originally written by Bruce Perrins. I had written the original draft of that, uh, discussed it for a month with the Debian developers. Debian is a Linux distribution, and made it their project policy. And Eric and I decided to relabel what we'd written for Debian as the open source definition and to say open source is software that gives you a list of nine rights, which is in the open source definition. The first right is free redistribution. This doesn't mean free as in no price. It means liberty. Um, you have to be free to redistribute your software to someone else. And actually, no price is a side effect. You can charge for that redistribution or not. It has to come with source code so that someone can maintain a program. If they go from a PC to a Mac, for example, they can change the software. Derived works have to be possible. If someone has to improve your program, um, they should be able to distribute the result. Uh, there is a provision about integrity of the author source code, which says that the author can sort of maintain their honor, and if you make a change, you might have to change the name of the program or mark out your change very clearly so that your change doesn't reflect on the author. There is no discrimination against people or groups. Uh, the example I usually use is you can't stop an abortion clinic or an anti-abortion activist from using the software. Uh, there's no discrimination against fields of endeavor, and that means the software has to be usable in a business as well as in a school. The license has to be distributable. In other words, um, I have to be able to give that license to someone, and that license then should work if that someone gives it to yet a third person. Uh, the license can't be specific to a product. In other words, if I um, distribute my software on a Red Hat system, the license can't say, you can't distribute this on a SUSE or a Debian system. The license can't contaminate other software. So if I distribute this on a CD with another program, it can't say that other program must be free, otherwise you can't distribute my software. Uh, and then the only other part of the open source definition is a list of licenses that were accepted. And the ones that we started with were the GPL, which was actually the example for a lot of what's in the open source definition, the BSD license, because software for BSD system pre-existed Linux. Uh, I, I think uh, the next moment that I thought was really pivotal was when the database vendors flipped over, which happened about three months sooner than I expected it to. It actually happened in, in late July, early August. That we Who were they? Commitments to do tier one ports from Oracle and, and Sybase and the other key database vendors. And why was that critical? Because we knew that in order for the open source story to be credible, and especially in order for the Linux story to be credible, we'd have to get commitments from independent software vendors to do ports of their applications to these platforms. And I was actually kind of worried. I, I, I felt that we were in a window of vulnerability between the time that uh, we announced the open source campaign and the database vendors flipped over. That was the point at which hostile action by, by Microsoft or other closed source software companies, that was the point at which a serious marketing blitz might actually have sunk us. But once the da big database vendors flipped over, that opened the way for other ISVs. That started a snowball effect going. Every six months or so, I would come back to the venture capitalists and I would show them the new numbers, showing more and more people adopting Linux, the new people porting, new users, and I'd show them our customer list. And our customer list was getting much more impressive. It was people like 
Cisco that were beginning to appear. People like the, you know the dot com companies were starting to show up on our our customer list, and eventually the venture capitalists, uh, you know, they kept looking at it and they kept saying, "Oh, we can't quite do it." Finally, Linus appeared on the cover of Fortune because there was something happening with open source. Well, at that point, the the venture capitalists couldn't ignore it. They just got sick of hearing about Linux everywhere, and they got tired of me just you know showing it to them every every at that point almost almost every week. So they, uh, they decided it was time to invest, that there was something happening. Well, I announced open source to the world on the internet. I did a lot of the early administrative work of starting the open source initiative. And I think six months later, I was reading the words open source in the news all the time and was totally astounded. And a year later, I believe Microsoft was talking about releasing some source code and someone in the press asked Steve Ballmer if they were going to open source their code, and Steve Ballmer said, well, open source means more than just releasing the source code. And I realized that he had read my document and understood it and was now telling the press about this. Now, if you're like just a guy on the net who's not doing this for a job at all, and you sort of write a manifesto, and it spreads out through the world, and a year later, the vice president of Microsoft is talking about that, you'd think you were on drugs, wouldn't you? But that's what really happened. <laughs> The local user groups tend to be more an issue of uh, building a social network, uh, especially getting people familiarized with the issues, uh, also just acting as a kind of support network for, for people who, who do not, for example, have the ability to pay for, for a commercial support network. So one thing they're doing in this area, for example, is they're making these, I think it's once a month, they're having install fests, which means that people who have problems getting Linux installed on their machine or have some issue, I mean, maybe they've actually installed Linux, but want to set up the network in a specific way, can actually bring in their machines to this users group meeting. And there's a lot of people there willing to help who've maybe seen that problem before. Well, actually, things aren't going so well. I tried it earlier myself. Uh, I had problems, and so I came to this install fest where all the gurus abound. Hopefully, I'll uh, have better luck getting it in. Instead of having uh, of sending emails or writing to news groups on the internet and waiting several days for the answer sometimes, it's easy to come here and find other people who might know about your problem and maybe able to help you. And hopefully within a few hours you have your machine installed. Originally I wanted to install on uh, my larger laptop and so I just did a search on the net and found where uh, there were resources to get help. And um, I'm here today because I'm trying to put Linux on this little guy right here, which is a Toshiba Libretto. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to do because it's a weird piece of hardware. So. Are there any chairs around here? Incredible. I think the Department of Justice case has made people aware of the fact that you should at least look for alternatives to Microsoft, and maybe Microsoft isn't the American dream after all. And that kind of shift in perception, uh, you can very clearly see that people just took Microsoft for granted. And maybe they're still buying Microsoft, but at least they're kind of more aware of the issue these days. Microsoft actually used Linux as defense. They used Linux to ground a claim that they don't have a monopoly because Linux could um, essentially push them off their catbird seat at any time. It was a very ingenious argument, totally specious, because it didn't, uh, it didn't do anything to answer the charge that they had previously engaged in bullying and various anti-competitive practices, but it was clever of them. In an event, the, the, the judge didn't buy it. Well, ordinarily, we in the Linux community are rather wary about letting Microsoft become the issue, but uh, there was a Slashdot article 
uh, about December of 98, yeah. where uh, a fellow named Matt at uh, The Noodle had pointed out that the, a gentleman in Australia had managed to receive a refund for the unused copy of Windows that came with his computer. So he declared uh, the 19th of January, was it January? Uh, no, it was February. It's February, I'm sorry. The 19th of February, he declared the 19th of February Windows Refund Day. And he encouraged everyone to go to their computer manufacturers and return their unused copies of Windows as it was specified in the Windows End User License Agreement. Yeah, it's important to remember that in the license itself it says that you can receive a refund if you, if you don't use the software and that the manufacturer is, is bound by law to do this or at least bound by contract and we found that you know if you called up these manufacturers they basically said it stopped bothering me kid and hung up on you. We didn't really want to sort of give out the location of where we were going to meet um, until you know at the very last second so what we did is we had people meet at places that we could control in the different towns around here so i was the san jose marshal and uh, i believe nick you were the san i was I, rick moen and i did san francisco right yeah. and so we we had maps there and we handed them off to everybody who was coming well we actually met at a denny's that's just outside the foster city limits uh foster city city limits which meant also that it was just outside the foster city police jurisdiction which meant that any any incidents that happened at the meeting point happened in the jurisdiction of San Mateo, and if they told us to get lost, we'd say, fine, we're going to Foster City, bye. It's sort of the Dukes of Hazard method of avoiding the cops, so. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we originally, we marched um, on the other side of this building. We marched around and up onto the parking structure that's up there. And that's where Microsoft had a reception laid out for us with drinks and a big sign that said, uh, you know, Microsoft welcomes the open source community. And the local uh, news cameras got shots of Eric Raymond and the Microsoft representative. Uh, the Microsoft story seemed to mostly be that uh, this was not an issue for Microsoft, but rather uh, from the OEMs. So we all needed to go back to our computer manufacturers and try yet again to try and get a refund from them. Uh, we responded to them saying, you know, that we've tried that, it's not possible, we need Microsoft to take action at this point. And they just repeated the tagline over and over again, you need to go to the OEMs, the manufacturers, and get your refunds there. We had about 150 people, probably about half of which had signs and such. So. Well, we ended up actually right in this courtyard here. Um, basically, we originally met, gathered outside. Various people sent uh, groups in, people from the FreeBSD camp sent a couple folks in. Um, we had Eric Raymond and Chris actually tried to go up eventually. And, yeah, uh, they had blocked the elevators off to us. Where were their offices? Um, their They're offices the were right up here on the ninth floor. We, uh, we got some really nice press out of it. And we think as a result, um, Toshiba made it possible for you to buy laptops without the operating system on it. So it's a small victory, but... Well, and you know, even, even now, uh, companies such as IBM and uh, a lot of other computer manufacturers are allowing you now to buy machines that don't have Windows on them. You know, when I was a kid and I went to school, the teachers were trying to teach us to share. They said, if you bring some candy, you can't eat it all yourself, you've got to share it with the other kids. But now the administration says teachers should be teaching kids to say yes to licensing. If you bring some software to school, oh no, don't share it. Sharing means you're a pirate. Sharing means you'll be put in jail. That's not the way society should work. We need the goodwill the willingness to help other people, at least when it's not too hard, because that's the basis of society. That's the fundamental resource that gives us a society instead of a dog-eat-dog -dog jungle. So what about people that say that if you have rampant piracy, it will eliminate the profit mode and then in the creative work software will not be Well, they're, they're wrong on both counts. For one thing, people are making a profit from developing free software, but for another, the freedom to have a community is more important. People that look at, casually look at open source free software and think, well, because you're supposed to share and do it for people's goodwill, doesn't that seem somewhat communist? What's your response? Absolute nonsense. It makes me really angry when people do that. Well, back in, back in 1989, actually, communism would have been a compliment. The, the, the word that people were using at that time was crazy. I wanted them to use capitalism. Communism is an ideology that forces people to share. If you don't share, you get thrown in jail or killed. In, in 1990, we got a visit from a, a director of an institute in uh, Moscow University, 
and uh, actually I saw him in Helsinki just two weeks ago. Uh, but in any event, he came by and Richard Stallman had suggested that he visit Cygnus because he was interested in, in understanding how the free software model might apply to stimulating entrepreneurial innovation in Russia, of all places. And we had been kind of secretive about our business plan because you know, we weren't really sure that it was going to work and we didn't want to uh, look too stupid if it failed. But uh, I was very, very open with him. And the more I told him, the more he started shaking his head like this. And I finally said, you know, what's, what's wrong? And he said, this sounds too much like communism to be successful in Russia. You, 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 you go to a gulag and end up in a mass grave with a bullet in the back of your head. Open source is not communism because it doesn't force people. Karl Marx did not invent helping your neighbor. Um, it's, it's not communist to have a commons. A commons existed long before communism as a philosophy of government. Uh, there are many commons in our lives. For example, we drive on the highway, something that is maintained for our common good. Um, actually, labeling our, our business model uh, it means that it, it misses the point a little bit. Whether it's communist or whether it's capitalist, the label doesn't matter. The real question is, how much value can you deliver? How scalable is the business? What kind of problems, what kind of rate of innovation can you sustain? And then however you want to label that is, is, uh, is really up to you. A lot of people described that August Linux world as Linux's coming out party. Linus Torvalds were very funny about that. He said, what, was, was Linux gay? <laughs> uh, but some people said, yeah, that was our, that was our debutante ball. That was when the, 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 the Linux guys, the hardcore hackers, really got it together with the suits. <laughs> At 3 p.m. on August 10, 1999, Linus Torvalds delivered the keynote address at Linux World. The crowd of 6,000 people began lining up at 12 noon. These guys have to clap. I pay them. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, looks like it's been a great show so far. Uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment, uh, I'm going to try and avoid the glare of the lights and just, just. I still think there's a lot of people, even though this is the second show, I still think there's a lot of people who don't quite get what it is that's so exciting about Linux. So there's this great show going on next door. There's huge exhibits and everything, but. It's the people out here that are the real contributors, not those companies. The person on next, I know you all know, so I don't have to uh, give anything in the way of introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Linus Torvalds. Linus. Calm down. down. Say, mm. yes. I don't want to just give one of my normal talks because I find them boring. Probably by now most of you find them boring too because you've heard them like 10 times. Uh, but after the technical update, we'll actually try whether we can do a questions and answers session with 5,000 people or how many of you there are there. Um, and it may not actually work out. 
because one of the 5,000 people is really loud. The one thing I will do, which I always do in all my talks, is, is the gratitude thing. Um, I want to kind of acknowledge the fact that I've obviously not been alone in, in doing Linux. Red Hat up 228%. This is the IPO that everybody was waiting for. They, of course, are behind the Linux operating software. RHAT. All I've gotten today are comments about what the stock price is. All morning, you know, it was at 41, it was at 42, it was at 47, it was at 53, it was at 51. Um, every machine, as far as I can tell, uh, on the show floor is pointed to their E-Trade accounts, to their broker accounts. They know the Red Hat price. I can't believe it. I, I'm the I heard, just heard 53. Oh, boy. Hang on. Let's, I didn't buy any. You didn't buy? <laughs> no, no, I didn't buy any. I should have bought, but uh, no, no, that's that's great if it's if it's if it's that. You guys don't know. Well, you know, Red Hat being successful just means that it legitimizes Linux, so it's much easier for us to go out. Kind of been a little bit divided. I mean, you've got a lot of people that are pretty hardcore, and they're 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 kind of offended by that, you know, because they've worked really hard and they're not really getting maybe their fair share out of that. Some people do get ticked, and you know, the thing that uh, you see that on a lot of mailing lists or on Slashdot, you know, you'll read this guy is uh, really mad because he didn't get a chance to he's he's didn't get a chance to do to get stock from Red Hat. He didn't get a chance to get uh, the, to get uh, a job from this other company, you know. But the, the kind of the shocking secret there is that most of the really hardcore guys, you know, they don't they don't care so much. The guys that are kind of really down in the trenches, they're writing this code because they need this code. If we could invite uh, Richard Stallman, who's the uh, founder of the Free Software Association, and Tim Ney, who's the managing director. There we go. <laughs> ah, here it is. Uh, Richard, I, I saw you playing your recorder at the, in Paris at that uh, Linux conference, but I didn't have an audio track. So you, would you get them to add audio to their uh, video downstream next time? Uh, I don't have any control over that. Unfortunately, those things can only be done with non-free software. Okay. Mm. All right. We'll give you uh, the award. And before you say a word, we'll have Tim and yourself hold up a a little representation of the contribution towards the Free Software Association. So, very uh, ironic things have happened, but nothing to match this. Giving the Linus Torvalds Award to the Free Software Foundation is sort of like giving the Han Solo Award to the Rebel Fleet. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, <clears throat> Some of you may not realize how far that analogy goes. But actually, let me tell you how, this, how we got here. See, what happened is, 15 years ago, if you wanted to use a computer, the only way you could do it was, to, was with proprietary software, software that divides and subjugates the users. And most people just, a lot of people didn't like it, but they saw no alternative. But some of us were determined to make an alternative. And we said, we're going to develop a free operating system, a free software operating system that will give users the chance to have freedom while they use their computers. Now, a lot of people said, well, it's a nice idea, but it's so hard. And we'll never get it done. So I don't want to participate. I don't believe you can ever get it done. But luckily, not everybody said that. And clearly, we knew we would eventually get the kernel done. But as it happens, somebody else did a better kernel before we did. Now, in the old days, we had an overall strategy for calling people's attention to the importance of freedom, to the freedom that they can have or not have when they use a computer. Well, what can we do about it? As far as I can tell, the only workable way of trying to change this and make that strategy work again is to spread the word that the operating system you're using is actually the GNU system. Somewhat modified, of course. 
And when people know this, they'll take a look at the reasons we developed this system, they'll think about these issues, and some of them will decide they agree. So I ask people, please tell people this is the GNU system. It's the combination of GNU and Linux, so we can call it GNU slash Linux. So Larry, when you were at Stanford eight, nine years ago doing your PhD, did you ever think you'd be in this position? No. All, all kidding aside. <laughs> no, I had no idea, what did you honestly. What you when you were finished up your PhD? Um, you know, that's a good question. I really didn't have a good idea. I mean, here we are on this huge show floor. There are people just going crazy about Linux. We had 6,200 people crammed into a room to see Linux speak, la Linux speak last night. Here we are with you know, all of these huge vendors all over the show. It, it's just you have no idea that this is going to happen. I mean, this is just this little operating system that we were happy with, that a few people cared about. You know, I thought I'd have a nice little consulting business. And here I am suddenly with all of this huge show going on. It's just incredible. I mean, a year ago, you could look and say, you know, this is going to be big. And everyone's standing at the show going, you know, the show was big last year. Is it going to be... Is it going to be as big this year? Then you remind them, you know, last year was only six months ago. Then they go, oh, Linux time. So leading up to the IPO, uh, we had uh, arrived actually in San Diego on Tuesday night. We spent Wednesday morning meeting investors in San Diego. We flew up to San Francisco. Spent Wednesday afternoon meeting uh, investment firms in San Francisco. Then on the Thursday morning of the IPO was when our stock would be traded publicly. So it was nice that we had ended the tour in San Francisco because we could go to the Credit Suisse trading desk the next morning to watch the public offering. And in San Francisco, being close enough to the company and to our families, we could invite people up to actually join us in the first trade. So I invited my wife, and we invited Linus and Tova, and a number of other friends and people who worked in the company to join us. Whenever we invite Linus and Tova, uh, they have uh, two young children, and uh, I have a daughter, Andrea, and we always bring the kids along. So we went into the Credit Suisse trading floor with all these traders and there these three-year-old kids running around and chasing each other around the show floor, around the trading floor. So Linus and I walked in and we walked up uh, into the trading floor and everyone was very excited and they, we kept asking them, well, is, how's it going? Are things going okay? And they said, oh, it's, uh, we're, we're really excited. We think things are going well. We don't want to, we don't want to say, you know, we don't want to jinx anything. We walked in it was a big screen TV showing CNBC. And it was amazing to us, but the theme for the day was Linux. Now we have an IPO that's going to go today, and when I mean go, it is going to go. The estimates I'm hearing are staggering, but watch VA Linux Systems. It goes at 1240 today. The symbol is LNUX, a provider of large-scale computer service and workstations specially designed for the Linux operating system. The original range on this IPO was 11 to $13, then 21 to 23, then 28 to 30, price to 30. And the estimates I'm hearing, I don't want to repeat because I don't have a confirmation, but if they're true, they will blow your mind when this stock takes off at 1240. I turned to Linus and I said, gee, did you ever think, you know, you'd walk in here someday and Linux would be the theme on CNBC and you know, Linus in his joking way said, oh, absolutely. So we walk in and, and they show us the buy and sell orders coming in and it's, it's incredible. We're seeing numbers like $320, $340 a share and I'm just in complete shock. You know, this is, this is over 10 times where we price the the offering it was incredible and I remember Linus just kind of sort of patting me on the back and saying just you know relax and uh, it was it was pretty exciting to see that I mean, we were it was just amazing we were stunned we were lucky that we were able to get back to the offices we had been in San Francisco so we could come back to VA's offices to, to, to see everyone in the office for the IPO we got back we had uh, uh, everyone was obviously very excited the IPO had done just tremendously well. Uh, we, we had a little party that we put together. 
Uh, it was interesting, while we were celebrating, though, there were plenty of people that were still trying to work. I recall cries of, be quiet, we're on the phone, we're working, uh, as we, uh, as we uh, went into the offices. One of the things I did was I gave the roadshow presentation for the employees back at the office so they could have an idea of what we'd been telling investors and understand exactly what we'd uh, put together for them. But again, the story of the day is VA Linux now up 766% to uh, $235 to $265. Sue, the best performing IPO ever. Here it goes. Sycamore Networks was a price to $38, surged to $270. This has just beat it. And by the way... So how do you feel about potentially billions of dollars of wealth being created from your creation, but you're not necessarily directly cashing out? So, if I hadn't made Linux available, I mean, I wouldn't have gotten any money that way either. So, I mean, it's a it's a win-win situation. Uh, just the the fact that there are a lot of commercial companies means that there are a lot of Linux people who used to work on Linux kind of on the side, and now they get paid for doing what they wanted to do. And that helps me in in the sense that. I wanted them to work on Linux anyway. The whole GNU project is really one big hack. It's one big act of subversive, playful cleverness to change society for the better, because I'm only interested in changing it for the better, uh, but in a clever way. Hi, we're the GNU Stallmans, and this is the free software song. Join us now and share the software. You 